Today on Next, from the New England News Collaborative, the debate over removing controversial statues. The past is never forgotten simply because a statue has been taken down. And we'll talk about students returning to in-person classes this fall. To think that younger people will be able to sit in a classroom with a mask on and maintain social distancing every day, all day, it just doesn't seem imaginable. Plus, with climate change comes more heat waves, trying to stay cool during a pandemic. I wasn't planning on getting wet, but I'm, yeah, after feeling the water, I'm like, wow, that water actually feel kind of good. Nice cool down. It's next. Next is produced at Connecticut Public Radio and is powered by the New England News Collaborative, 10 public media companies coming together to tell the story of a changing region with support from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I'm Morgan Springer. Thanks for joining us. Quarry workers in westerly Rhode Island unearthed some of the nation's finest granite. Between the mid-19th and 20th centuries, the town's expert sculptors shaped the stone into buildings, monuments, markers, graves, and mausoleums that left Rhode Island and were erected in 42 states. Now, amid a national debate on public monuments, Westerly is considering the future of one statue that never left town. Alex Nunes of the Publix Radio has the story. Standing in Wilcox Park in downtown Westerly, John Kaduri says you don't have to go far to see signs of Westerly's proud granite history. Just look across the street, he says, for reminders of the companies and workers who helped build numerous landmarks around town. Smith Granite Company, Christ Episcopal Church, New England Granite Works, the Town Hall, the Industrial Trust Building, if you look at the Corinthian Capitals, New England Granite Works. Westerly blue, gray, or pink granite can be found all around town from the foundations of homes and retaining walls to the public library's impressive entrance and archway to the statues, gravestones, and mausoleums in Riverbend Cemetery. And in recent weeks, there's one monument in Westerly that's getting extra attention. And so it says, Joseph Kuderi Granite Company, Westerly, Rhode Island, dedicated October 12, 1949. Kuderi and I are standing beside a 15-foot monument to Christopher Columbus, carved of blue westerly granite by the company his grandfather founded in 1916 and father ran from 1940 until its closure in the early 1960s. The statue depicts Columbus larger than life, standing poised atop an elevated base with one hand on a globe and the other clutching a telescope. Kaduri says the monument has personal significance to him, as well as special meaning to his town. And I feel very proud about the, the Columbus Monument. This is a representation of the fine quality artistic work that was done here in Westerly in the granite industry at numerous companies. When the statue was dedicated more than 70 years ago, company owners and workers wanted to commemorate the quarrymen and fine artisans who helped build landmarks and structures around the country. From the Bethesda Fountain in Central Park, to the iconic Traveler's Tower in Hartford, to the intricate base of a statue commemorating Confederate General Stonewall Jackson in Charlottesville. They also wanted to recognize the town's large Italian population, which helped build the granite industry. Back then, Christopher Columbus seemed like an appropriate figure to memorialize. But today, many people say he isn't, and the statue needs to go. I do not believe that he's a figure worth glorifying. Nancy Fiore Chetiar says growing up in Westerly, she never thought twice about the Columbus statue. But after going to college and learning about the explorer's complicity in the enslavement and killing of indigenous people, she thinks differently about the monument. If we continue to commemorate Christopher Columbus and celebrate what folks call his achievements, we are celebrating genocide and we're celebrating the death, rape, enslavement of indigenous people. Fiori Chetiar is among the more than 320 people who've already signed an online petition calling for the statue's removal. She's contacted the public library, which owns the park where the monument stands, and rallied other people through social media. Linda Chafee, who comes from one of the town's original granite families and co-authored a book on westerly granite with Ellen Madison and John Kaduri, says census records show that in 1900, some 50 to 60 percent of westerly residents had a connection to the granite industry. And the Columbus statue helps preserve that history. Put a sign next to it and explain it. Put it in context. 
let's put it out there. Let's accept the past as history and let's learn from it. The question of what to do with the monument is a sensitive subject. The statue has yet to make it onto the town council agenda, and the library says it needs time to research the history of the monument and who it belongs to. Right now, neither the town nor the library is willing to claim ownership of the statue and the tough decisions that will have to come along with it. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Alex Nunes. Statues of Christopher Columbus have already been removed in multiple cities in Connecticut. In Boston last month, the city took down a Columbus statue that was vandalized. And in Bangor, Maine, the city council has considered removing a monument to a Portuguese explorer who abducted indigenous people. As the debate continues over what to do with statues of controversial historical figures, we reached out to Manisha Sinha. She's a Civil War historian and professor at the University of Connecticut. Professor Sinha, welcome to Next. Thank you for having me, Morgan. In the story about the Christopher Columbus Monument in Westerly, Rhode Island, that we just heard, one woman suggests the statue should remain, but she thinks a sign should be erected to contextualize it. And she says, let's accept the past as history and let's learn from it. What do you think about that? I think it is important first to say that when we take down statues or erect statues, we are neither doing history nor are we erasing history. We are choosing public figures from the past to commemorate. And that is why I think many of these statues have become controversial, because a lot of people don't want to commemorate their actions. So Christopher Columbus's statue is an interesting example because Columbus, of course, never came to British North America. He went to the Caribbean. We also know from his writings and that of some other Spanish conquistadors that they were involved in a fairly brutal repression of the native population, including the murder and torture of women and children. So I think the voices of many communities should be heard. And we should democratically discuss in towns and local communities whether we want statues of people who committed crimes against human rights to represent us today uh, as a city or a town. Now, I want to talk about last month, the Boston Arts Council unanimously voted to take down a statue of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln standing with a copy of the Emancipation Proclamation in one hand, with a formerly enslaved man kneeling beside him. What do you think about removing that statue? That particular representation of emancipation was problematic precisely because it showed a kneeling black man. And it is a very kind of paternalistic image with Lincoln benevolently stretching his hand over that man's head. And it's an image that Lincoln himself was uncomfortable with because when he went to the fallen capital of the Confederacy, Richmond, at the end of the Civil War, many people fell at his feet and he is purported to have said, you must not fall before me, you must kneel before God only. But that statue also has an interesting history that I think most American citizens should be aware of. The money for that statue was raised by African Americans. In fact, Charlotte Scott, a black woman, donated the first $5 she earned in freedom to erect that statue to Lincoln because African Americans wanted to commemorate Lincoln's role in emancipation. And I do think it needs to be contextualized. We need other statues showing a more true history of emancipation, showing African Americans were not just simply the recipients of the gift of freedom that they had, in fact, fought for their own freedom, and in fact had begun the emancipation process in the Civil War by simply fleeing to Union Army lines in large numbers. What's interesting is like how these statues do or do not stand the test of time. And as we're talking about removing these statues, how do we do a better job of replacing them with somebody who deserves to be honored and celebrated and also stands the test of time? I do think it is important that our public landscape honor other people. We don't have that many statues of women or Native Americans or African Americans. You know, it sends a message about what the American Republic should look like and what American citizenship is all about. We don't talk about this often. Markers and statues of African Americans have always been vandalized. So if you think about it, there is some kind of opposition to commemorating Black people, which just seems like a simple, symbolic thing to do. And so 
it is important to remember these are contested spaces of democracy and citizenship in the United States. As a historian, is it frustrating to you to see these statues and this representation of history politicized in this way when you've looked at the documents and you can say Christopher Columbus enslaved people and and murdered many indigenous people and the Confederate generals were fighting to uphold slavery. You have all this context, but you're watching one single encapsulated moment of our history being battled over. It does frustrate me. And part of it, I think, is historical illiteracy. You know, there's this notion that somehow if we include the histories of many groups in our past, that somehow we are replacing another history. We are not replacing them. We are telling more human stories, more realistic stories of the past. The problem is when we think of history as myth, uh, and we set up the founding fathers as some sort of demigods in mythic ways, that's really doing violence to history. And I think uh, it is important for historians to weigh in these public discussions because many people have no idea about the complexity of the past. So yes, there is a way to talk about history in more complex ways rather than make it a debate over single statues. Manisha Sinha is a professor at the University of Connecticut and a Civil War historian. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us, Professor Sinha. Thank you for having me. The World Health Organization officially gave COVID-19 its name in February. But before anyone knew what to call it, some U.S. politicians and journalists dubbed it the Chinese virus, or Wuhan coronavirus, referring to the city that saw the first cases. Those early labels fit into a history of anti-Asian racism in the United States. That may be why some Asian American businesses in Connecticut and Massachusetts reported a drop in customers well before any local outbreaks. As the pandemic carries on, many Asian and Pacific Americans fear they'll be the target of racism. WSHU's Cassandra Basler reports. An Asian student got punched in the jaw in midtown Manhattan in early March. She told the WABC reporter she wanted to remain anonymous as she recalled being attacked by a woman on the street. I remember exactly what she said. She said, where is your mask, you coronavirus And right after that, she just punched my chin. So I was really shocked. It's one of several incidents since the coronavirus that prompted investigations of bias attacks. The NYPD arrested two anti-Asian hate crime suspects that same month. One who police say shouted expletives and pushed a father. Another, they say, yelled anti-Asian comments and kicked a man. Two days later, a reporter at a White House press briefing asked President Donald Trump. Why do you keep calling this the Chinese virus? There are reports of dozens of incidents of bias against Chinese Americans in this country. Your own aide, Secretary Azar, says he does not use this term. He says ethnicity does not cause the virus. Why do you keep using this? Because it comes from China. It's not racist at all. No, not at all. It comes from China. A leaked Republican communication strategy memo outlined talking points that directed blame for the coronavirus away from the president and towards China. The president was already backpedaling. There was a tweet where he said, don't blame Asian Americans for this. Rita Pin Ahrens is executive director of the OCA, Asian Pacific American Advocates, in Washington, D.C. That tweet she mentioned from the president drew strong criticism from prominent Asian American journalists. CBS White House correspondent Weijia Jiang tweeted with emphasis that Trump said Asian Americans need our protection. She noted Trump then tweeted, they are helping us, as if Asian Americans are not also one of us. Or as Rita Pin Aaron says, there's been a long standing feeling that we have not been fully accepted as Americans, that we have been perpetually uh, stigmatized as foreign and other. And Pin Aarons wants Trump to take action against anti-Asian bias. We need to have an executive order forming another task force that looks at this problem across the country. But she isn't waiting around for that to happen. 
OCA created a website back in the 90s where people can report if they experience or observe anti-Asian hate incidents. They now work with several other nonprofits to compile this data nationwide. There hadn't been too much activity in hate incidences before COVID-19. And so I think within the last few months, we've certainly seen a spike. One of their partner groups is Stop Asian American and Pacific Islander Hate. The group tracked these incidents from March through June and counted more than 2,000 nationwide. They spiked when Trump started to call the pandemic the Chinese virus. Over 800 incidents were reported in California and nearly 300 in New York. Everything from being taunted by strangers that we have coronavirus to spitting and physical assaults on our elders and our children. The data even show who's been targeted. Pin Aaron says that helps determine where to focus solutions, like bystander intervention training. Women were three times more likely to have a hate incident than men were. Now, is this because API women are more likely to be out doing the grocery shopping or out in the community? Um, you know, is it that people feel that, you know, they're more vulnerable? She hopes this data fills the gaps, so harassment that falls short of a police hate crime investigation can at least be tracked. It's hard to prove a crime was motivated by bias. And the Department of Justice says more than half of hate crimes don't get solved because they don't get reported. People aren't always comfortable reporting because they don't know what happens to the data. Also, they're not quite sure what can be done afterwards. Even if police could do more, would a hate crime survivor feel any safer? Some restaurant workers in New Haven, Connecticut, struggled with this. Maylene Malikon is a rising junior in college. She works at a Lao and Thai eatery called Pha Ket Kao. Back in April, she finished a morning shift, walked to her car, and noticed something strange. And I thought it was like crumbs on like the front seat, but it was just like glass. Someone shattered Malikon's windshield while her car was parked downtown at the restaurant storefront. She didn't know what to do, so she called her parents. They initially thought it was a hate crime because they, like, um, they're kind of so paranoid about, like, the whole COVID situation, but, like, there was actually, like, no proof of it being one. Malikon says there was no slur written near the scene that made her think to report a hate crime, so she reported vandalism. New Haven police told her street camera angles didn't capture her car, so they had no leads. I understand where the cops are coming from. Christine Sun is the daughter of the store owner and manages the restaurant books. She says she first assumed Malikon's windshield was random vandalism. Then her mother told her she found a large dent on her car. It looked like it had got hit with a baseball bat. My first thought was, I think it had to be because they're Asian. Someone was watching. We're the only store on that block that's open right now, and we happen to be an Asian restaurant. They can't classify as a hate crime because they don't have proof, but, you know, it just, it adds up. So Sun took to the restaurant's Facebook and Instagram to ask for leads. I went to social media because I was mad. My mom's just trying to make ends meet and pay rent for her restaurant because rent is still due. Utilities are still due. So she's she's there because she needs to make money to keep her restaurant afloat. Sun says the restaurant was able to keep a quarter of its revenue by offering takeout and delivery. And then the New Haven Independent reported the vandalism as a possible racist attack. That led to a bump in business and a GoFundMe page that raised more than $1,000 to help with car repairs. Before the GoFundMe, an actual customer walked in and said, I just read the article, asked to speak to my mom, and handed her $200. The restaurant is still recovering, like many Asian businesses hit hard before the shutdown. Days before the coronavirus was declared a global pandemic, New Yorkers crowded brunch spots in Brooklyn, but many avoided going for dim sum in Chinatown. That same month, unemployment spiked for Asians in New York, at least three times more than any other race. Sun urges everyone of Asian descent to be hyper aware of their surroundings, especially her mother. My cousin, who used to manage the restaurant, actually bought her pepper spray for her birthday this past year. So she has that. Sun says a group of teenagers recently mugged her mother in the parking garage near her restaurant. Whether or not that incident was hate related, server Maylene Malikon says her coworkers are still scared. They don't like to park on the street and she keeps checking the restaurant windows. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Cassandra Basler.
That story is part of WSHU's series, Virus of Hate, on anti-Asian racism during the pandemic, and is supported by the Graustein Memorial Fund. After the break, schools across New England are still figuring out how to safely teach students this fall. We'll talk about that. Plus, how the pandemic and climate change are making it harder to cool off this summer. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the Common Sense Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of climate change and the evolving clean energy economy. Support also comes from Douglas Stone and Mary Schwab Stone through the Smart Family Foundation of New York. Welcome back. I'm Morgan Springer. What to do about schools this fall? It's an agonizing decision, really. I don't envy the people making it. With just over a month till school starts, all New England states appear to be on track to reopen school. Figuring out how to do it safely is on a lot of people's minds. Several states are still thinking through the options, and in some cases, letting school districts decide if they want to return to in-person classes, virtual learning, or a combination of both. It's not just tough on school administrators. It's also a complicated and anxiety-inducing issue for teachers and families. Maine Public Radio's Robbie Feinberg reports. Remote learning at Ashley Muncie's house in Hollis has been hectic, to say the least. She's got three young kids, including a one-year-old daughter. When school closed in March, her husband worked from their basement, and she juggled multiple Zoom meetings for their kids each day, and took care of the baby as the pandemic unfolded around them. So it was hard. My kids didn't much care for remote learning. They missed being in school, and they missed the schedule of it all. It did get better. We started to kind of have a flow, but they are definitely looking forward to returning to school. Another Hollis parent, Meredith Charlton, is also eager for her son to go back. He struggled socially, she says, and Charlton says she feels like he's taken five steps back during the pandemic. But while Charlton trusts local school officials to keep kids safe, she's got questions. Like who will provide child care for students if they can only go to school a few days per week? And how will she be able to protect herself from the virus, particularly as a nurse who's immunosuppressed after a kidney transplant? You know, as a nurse at the bedside, you know, if I get it, what happens? You know, what happens to my family and my patients? And um, it's scary. I work in the NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit with, you know, sick, vulnerable babies. Um, And certainly we don't want them to get infected. Health, safety, child care, they're just a few of the many complicated factors that parents, teachers and schools are thinking about as they weigh reopening. The unknown right now is very scary for parents. And that's what we're we're facing right now is an unknown. Carrie Woodcock is the executive director of the Maine Parent Federation. She says while some parents want their children to head back, others, particularly those with immunocompromised children, are nervous, with some saying they won't send their children back into the classroom until a COVID-19 vaccine is available. You know, overwhelming amount of parents want to know that their children are going to be safe. I, I would say that's the one consistency. And for some parents, safe means that health is the priority concern and for other parents safety means that their academics take priority and their social and emotional learning take priority and I can see all three sides. For North Yarmouth parent Sarah McIntyre, the negative effects of staying home outweigh the risk of the virus for her family. McIntyre has had to cut back her work schedule to one day a week so she can care for her teenage daughter, who has Down syndrome and autism. Without the basic routines and in-person therapies at school, McIntyre says her daughter has had both medical problems and behavioral issues. I really do hope they open the schools because I don't know what we're going to do. But other parents say a lot of questions still need to be answered before they're comfortable with reopening. Amanda Cooper is a parent from Buxton who also teaches middle school in a neighboring district. She says she desperately wants to see her students, particularly after seeing how remote learning didn't work for many kids. But she's also acutely aware of the risks. We have to do so safely. We absolutely have to do everything within our power to mitigate any potential risks to exposures because this pandemic is not something, this virus is not something that we really have a solid grasp on yet. And um, 
I don't think public schools should be the um, <laughs> test subjects to see how that goes, quite frankly. Maine Education Association President Grace Levitt says ensuring that safety will require more resources, more PPE, new school configurations, and more staff to transport students, clean school buildings, and deliver meals. Uh, really, it's, the list is pretty lengthy, how to make the facility safe and how to make the, the way we do instruction safe for in-person learning. And that's the goal that everybody wants to get back to is in person because we know that that is absolutely the best for our students. But we need to keep everybody safe and that has to be taken care of. The Maine Department of Education estimates that the costs of implementing CDC guidelines statewide could total more than $320 million. But local school leaders say towns can't afford to bear the brunt of that cost locally, particularly as many districts are actually cutting school budgets because of declining tax revenue during the pandemic. Last week, Maine Governor Janet Mills announced that the state would provide about $165 million in money it's received from the Federal CARES Act to help school districts reopen, with hope that Congress will provide more. I want students, parents, and teachers and school staff to feel safe and confident in returning to their beloved schools. And I believe strongly that those decisions about returning to classrooms should be based on public health data, not on politics. Mills also announced several basic guidelines for schools in Maine to reopen. They include requiring mask wearing for children over two, and social distancing and symptom screening. The state is also looking at public health data to advise schools on their own reopening plans. And it's asking districts to prepare for several different scenarios, whether that's in-person learning, remote learning, or something in between. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Robbie Feinberg. Now joining us on Next is Sherita Fauché. She has two kids in a charter school in Mattapan, a Boston neighborhood. She's also the co-director of the Collaborative Parent Leadership Action Network. Sherita is here to talk about how some parents in Massachusetts are feeling about sending their kids back to school. Sherita, welcome to Next. Thank you for having me. So we're hearing about teachers who are worried about the health risks of going back to school. And I'm wondering, as a parent, how do you feel about sending your kids back? It's it's very anxiety provoking. And, you know, the struggle with having seen my kids really miss school and being in school and being with their friends. And I think they're more focused on just getting back to school and not really understanding how that will look different for them. But as a parent, definitely being worried about exposure to COVID. And it's difficult because it's not as if there's kind of a solid plan that's been laid out at this time. And that plan probably won't come until we get closer until the start of school. Yeah. So in the state of Massachusetts, where you live, they've put out some requirements like that students in the older grades have to wear masks and teachers have to wear masks and there has to be regular hand washing and they have to be at least three feet apart indoors minimum. But what are the main concerns for you about the current guidelines? That sounds doable for adults in a workplace setting. To think that younger people uh, will be able to sit in a classroom with a mask on and maintain social distancing every day, all day during a school day, it doesn't seem imaginable. Coupled with a number of kids have to commute to school. And whether that is commuting on public transportation or whether that's commuting on a school bus, for quite a chunk of time, kids are being exposed to others in an enclosed tight space. So I think it's a lot of the logistical things that myself and other parents have questions about that there isn't really concrete answers toward. And understandably so, I think there's a lot that the school would be unable to answer at this point because there's just so many moving variables. Is there any part of you that feels upset with the state and school officials and how they've kind of laid out at least the beginning plan so far? Schools closed mid-March. So we've had from mid-March up until this point to really kind of think through what these options and opportunities would look like. I think if there's any way to double back or to think moving forwardly how schools, educators, and officials would 
really bring in the parent voice, bring in the student voice, right? Like we're planning for kids, not knowing how they're going to feel, respond, or react to this environment. And then we're going to be really judgmental of them when they don't fall in line. So given the information that you have right now, and of course, that information is always changing, what do you want as a parent? You know, do you want your kids back in the classroom? Do you want them to continue distance learning? As a parent, I would like to be able to choose and I would like the freedom and flexibility to be able to change that choice. I don't know that I want a full week of in-person learning. So I would love to have a hybrid option. I would love to have the flexibility if we started on a hybrid option to be able to change to either all virtual learning or maybe all in-school learning. Um, So I think offering parents as many options, but also the flexibility to go in and out and to be able to account for some of that change in difference because things also change for families. And so is that something that you are advocating for with state officials and your school district? Does that seem like something that actually might happen? We are definitely pushing for that and advocating. I think we're also advocating to partner with parent and parent organizations, not only to develop these plans, but also to offer the opportunity for parents to get training in whether it's special education tools or just kind of bolstering parents' capabilities to be able to support their children at home during this learning because we do not know what the fall will look like. If we saw how this kind of played out the first time, how are we ensuring that parents feel confident but also have the opportunity to access whatever resources their students need? That was Sherita Fauché, the co-director of the Collaborative Parent Leadership Action Network in Massachusetts and the mother of two students at a charter school in Boston. Another week has gone by, and New England states still appear to be avoiding the recent surge in coronavirus cases that have hit much of the country. As we've reported on next, nursing homes in our region were hit hard by the first wave of the virus. Here to talk with us about the current state of nursing home testing in Connecticut and beyond is Connecticut Public Radio reporter Patrick Scahill. Patrick, welcome back to Next. Hi, thanks. Patrick, to start with, in the majority of New England states, 60% or more of coronavirus tests have happened in nursing homes or long-term care facilities. And yet recently, Connecticut's Governor Ned Lamont announced he would scale back testing requirements for nursing homes in the state. What's the change? So uh, back in June, Governor Ned Lamont uh, issued an executive order that required weekly testing for nursing home staff. Uh, A few days later, though, the governor scaled that order back. He said testing staff wasn't necessary if the facility was COVID-free for two weeks. Since then, Lamont and his administration actually have said that uh, that change is in line with uh, federal guidance from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And just to clarify, this is staff, not all nursing home residents. So staff and residents. Okay. Um, and, And how does this compare to nursing home testing requirements in other New England states? Well, um, during a media briefing on July 9th, Lamont said that he believed Connecticut had the, quote, toughest testing standards at nursing homes probably in the country. Uh, That got us curious. We looked around a little bit. And actually, in Massachusetts uh, and New York, the requirements are a little bit tighter. Uh, In Massachusetts, state officials are requiring nursing homes conduct new baseline testing of nursing home staff that had to happen no later than July 19th. Uh, After that, they're requiring weekly or biweekly testing. And then again, in New York, um, where more than 6,000 nursing home residents have died from COVID-19, Governor Andrew Cuomo adopted strict requirements there. Those rules say that nursing homes and adult care facilities have to test or arrange testing for staff uh, once a week. So a little bit tighter than in Connecticut. So opponents of Lamont's move, what are they saying? What are they worried about? In a joint letter to uh, Lamont recently, three legal aid groups here in Connecticut said that his recent modification is out of step with federal guidance from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, Kevin Brophy is an elder law attorney with Connecticut Legal Services, and he says the change has his clients, who are nursing home residents, and their families scared. What we're concerned about is that you have staff that don't live in the nursing home, they work in the community, and they could unintentionally bring COVID-19 into the nursing home. 
But uh, one thing, Morgan, that's worth noting here is that there is a real cost to running all of these tests and taking all these uh, samples. State contracts show tens of millions of dollars in federal money have been budgeted to pay for this, but that money runs out at the end of August. And after that, the state says it's unclear who's going to foot the bill. So is that factoring into why Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont is scaling back the frequency of this testing? What, what reason has he given? So his administration says, no, cost is not the driving factor here. Again, they've said that uh, federal guidance from the CDC is uh, the driving factor here. That guidance has changed uh, a bit uh, over the past uh, few weeks and months. Really at issue here in that guidance is sort of a wonky phrase, minimal to no community transmission. So before I let you go, I want to just shift gears slightly to another reporting project you're currently right in the middle of, also to do with testing, but not specific to nursing homes. And you've asked the state of Connecticut how much they've paid for coronavirus tests, how much they paid seven vendors specifically that they've contracted with during the pandemic. And and what was the response? Well, the response was a partial answer. They told me the aggregate amounts they'd paid to those vendors. They told me the average price per test paid to all of the vendors. What they redacted from the contracts, however, was the individual price the state was paying each vendor for each test. The response from the state has been that the vendors deemed those prices a trade secret, um, and the state's saying that FOI law allows this. And FOI is uh, Freedom of Information Act. Now, how is the state claiming that this is trade secret when these tests are being paid by taxpayer money, right? Right. So our argument has been that basic pricing information does not amount to a trade secret uh, under the Freedom of Information Act and is not a reason for a redaction in this case. Additionally, uh, we're arguing the state has apparently failed to do its own analysis of the merits of the trade secrets exemption because the way the state structured these contracts, it was the vendors that were actually introducing the price redactions uh, from the contracts, uh, not the state. The state was signing off on those redactions, but the vendors were doing the redactions. So for those two reasons, we are we are challenging those redactions. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. Patrick Scahill is a reporter at Connecticut Public Radio and has been a guest host on Next. Patrick, thanks for talking to me. You're welcome. Thank you. New England is seeing more heat waves due to climate change. And staying cool is even harder this year because of COVID-19. New Hampshire Public Radio's Annie Ropeek takes a look at how her state is coping. It's a hot and humid day in downtown Manchester, New Hampshire, and the sprinklers built into a high school soccer field are on full blast. Several families are out here, kids chasing their parents through the sprinklers with squirt guns. Everyone, including this reporter, is soaked. I wasn't planning on getting wet, but I'm, yeah, after feeling the water, I'm like, wow, that water actually feel kind it's of good. It's a nice cool down. Pablo yeah. Rodriguez says there's nowhere else for his kids to go on a day like this. They can't play outside at home. That driveway, they don't really take care of that apartment that well, so we don't let the kids play outside. So there's too many like broken glass, nails all over the driveway. Turning on these sprinklers in the afternoon instead of early morning is one of the few ways Manchester can respond to heat waves right now. The city pools are closed, and so are typical cooling stations like the public library. Deborah Hurd is watching her daughter and grandkids run through the sprinklers. She says it reminds her of growing up in New York, playing in open fire hydrants. Now, while her family is cooped up at home in the pandemic, she says they're trying to use less air conditioning. It's expensive, it's really hot, and you're in there all the time, so you want the air to circulate. That's already reflecting on the bills. There's an irony here. The expensive extra power used for cooling in these hotter summers is contributing to the carbon emissions that are causing the increase in temperatures. Here in New England, we are seeing a particular rise in these kind of extreme heat days. Rachel Cletus of the Union of Concerned Scientists says in the past, the Northeast has only seen about a dozen days a year that feel like they're over 90. That could triple by late century if the world doesn't act quickly to curb carbon emissions. In New Hampshire alone, there have been about two weeks over 90 so far this summer, compared to a historical average of just three days. And globally, 2020 has been the second hottest year on record after 2016. Cletus says even if we were to stop using fossil fuels, people in New Hampshire and across New England will have to get used to more extreme heat. It kills more people in the U.S. each year than any other kind of weather, including things like hurricanes and floods more often associated with climate change. 
Heat is most dangerous to the very young, very old, people who work outside or are homeless or incarcerated, and people of color and people who live in cities. Folks with asthma or other health problems are also at greater risk, just like they are for COVID-19. And this summer, Cletus says... They're faced with a difficult situation where the only way to stay safe is actually going to be to stay home. But she says home air conditioning and other cooling options aren't a given in New England like they are in places that are used to the heat this region is starting to see. Buildings here are designed to trap heat, not alleviate it. Right now, there aren't many options in New Hampshire for people who need an AC and can't afford one. One exception is Project Cool Air, run on donations by a nonprofit in Portsmouth. Mary Jane Walsh is the program's director. She says they give out ACs to provide at least one cool room for low-income seniors and other at-risk residents in the county. In the summer, we think of air conditioning as something nice to have, and it's certainly helpful. Um, But for some of these people, it is the difference between healthy living and and not. This year, with cooling centers closed and everyone stuck at home, they've seen an increase in demand. Walsh says they delivered 25 ACs as of early July versus 15 at the same time last year. I, I do wish we would hear sooner rather than later, but unfortunately that is, you know, when you're right in the middle of that heat wave, the phones start ringing. The pandemic has caused some local officials to focus more on preparing for extreme heat instead of just reacting to it. In Nashua, New Hampshire, emergency manager Justin Cates says this year saw their heat response plan totally upended. Now they're shuttling people to the mall until they can safely reopen cooling centers with health precautions in place. And they're thinking about how federal coronavirus aid money could help them distribute ACs or more efficient heat pumps. Really, one of the only reasons why something like this could be done is is you've got the funding available to try and respond to COVID-19, but also try and find ways to make the community more resilient for other types of hazards as well. Nashua has a new temporary employee from the Centers for Disease Control Foundation whose entire job is to help rethink the city's heat plan. That worker just started, ahead of yet another heat wave in the Northeast. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Annie Ropeek. That story is part of New Hampshire Public Radio's climate change project, By Degrees. Coming up, we head to two community gardens that are more than just a place to grow food. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the John Merck Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of climate and clean energy. We're back. Coronavirus has pushed a lot of people to spend more time outside, so it's no surprise that gardening has grown in popularity. At this challenging time, Boston's community gardens hold an even deeper meaning. WGBH Radio's Liz Nieslaus visits two neighborhoods to hear from local residents. In Dorchester, where the clatter of a passing train gives way to the scrape of a rake, the Greenwood Street Community Garden is thriving. There are more than 175 community gardens scattered like jewels through the city of Boston. Oh, messy, messy me. Oh, things in what they used to be. No. Singer and community gardener Barry Lawton has an astounding variety in his plot. I am growing potatoes, red and white, uh, melons, cantaloupe, watermelon. Like the days when people began victory gardens to grow food in wartime, Lawton sees this as his modern-day victory garden in the fight against COVID. We're at war with an invisible virus, and one of the things that people did while they were at war was have a victory garden, to look down the line and know that we are eventually going to get rid of this, we're eventually going to have a victory. Renee Burgess is manager of the Greenwood Street Community Garden. She says there's a waiting list for garden plots, and not just because people are feeling cooped up from the coronavirus. The other part of it is really the lack of fresh vegetables at the one store that we have for this whole neighborhood. And with that one store, they don't always have that variety. So this is a great way to produce a sustenance for us. 
Today, Burgess is getting some advice on organic pest control from the Boston Community Gardens engagement manager, Michelle DeLima. Yeah, this is normal on zucchini leaves. DeLima says she's seen requests for plots in community gardens more than double. A lot of times long-term residents and newer residents don't have a lot of places where they would come together and do something together. And the garden is one of those places, you know, because gardening has this appeal that is so broad where people actually come together and they're working to a common purpose. That sense of common purpose sparked Boston's community gardens movement back in the late 70s. Back then, the city was divided by court-ordered school desegregation and busing. And there were more than a thousand vacant lots all over Boston garbage-strewn lots were transformed into healthy, beautiful spaces and a source of food. And several times, the National Guard was called in to deliver trucks of topsoil. Mattapan's Wilson Street was once known for murders. Wow! You have a flower, wow! So pretty! It's now known for its community garden that draws people in. Neighbors grow flowers, vegetables and herbs and come for community events. The squash is doing good. On this sunny day, Robin Gibson has come to check on her plants. There's weeding and watering to do. We've been here our whole lives, but we've seen beyond just the violence. I think in a lot of communities there is violence. And so what we want to show is that there's so much more to Mattapan and to Wilson Street. There's so much more to us, to the people who live around here. A garden can't solve everything, but positive things can take root. It's such a great community that is predominantly black, that is on the brink of gentrifying. So we've all been fighting hard to get these kinds of gardens and things here. And we want to make sure that the people who are here can continue to love it and be a part of their community. And in the garden, one generation gives green shoots to the next. So this one, like cut it here, like you want to get the leaves. Why? Right here? A little bit up. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Liz Nieslaus. People 65 and older have been hardest hit by the coronavirus. They make up 80% of all COVID deaths in the U.S. Today we remember someone who does not fall in that age group. Mary Crimmins of Longmeadow, Massachusetts was 57 years old and lived in a group home. Carrie Healy of New England Public Media talked to Mary's sister. She's always been in a group home setting since she was 22. She knew that she was, you know, quote unquote, a little different. She knew she had Down syndrome, um, but uh, she never let that stand in the way. Susan says when they were young, Mary was just one of the five Crimin siblings who enjoyed running, bicycling, and downhill skiing. Mary loved working at McDonald's, movies, music, and a good party. The only person I knew who was just excited to have another birthday and turn another year older. <laughs> Can you believe I'm going to be 57? You know, and I was like, oh gosh, Mary, you know. Most people don't want to talk about their age, but nope, she loved it. And her birthday was July 28th, and she would start talking about it the next year on the 29th of July. It was the biggest holiday of the year for her. She just loved it. Mary got a kick out of making the extra effort and wearing makeup and cultivating her own fashion sense. You know, you might say, oh, that, that bow's too big. That didn't matter to Mary. If she wanted it, she, she was going to wear it. Um, or that pocketbook's maybe a little too much for you. Nope, if, if she liked it, she liked it. Susan says Mary liked to have the glitter and the flash, and she loved jewelry. She was in the hospital, you know, for the week before she passed, and she was on a ventilator. And uh, my sister Jennifer said she was talking to the nursing staff, and they're like, oh, she still has a ring on. Even when she was sick, you know, she still went to her go-to accessories and, and always tried to look her best. So she was just a character in so many ways really, really sweet person and a wonderful sister. Susan Crimmins' sister, Mary Catherine Crimmins, passed away on May 31st from COVID-19. She was 57 years old. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Carrie Healy. And that's our show this week. Next week, we'll bring you a special episode of Stories that recently won national and regional awards. In the meantime, you can check out past episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Just search Next New England. 
Next is produced by me, Morgan Springer. Vanessa De La Torre is our executive editor. The executive producer is Katie Talarski. Daniela Luna is our intern. All the music you hear on Next is by musicians in New England. If you want to know who you heard today, visit our show page at nextnewengland.org. The New England News Collaborative is powered by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Connecticut Public Radio, Vermont Public Radio, New Hampshire Public Radio, Maine Public Radio, New England Public Media, WBUR, WCAI, WGBH, WSHU, and the Public's Radio. 